Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Ashley Dare. I'm an associate professor at Virginia Tech, and I'm here presenting today with Emily Singular. I want to have a shout out to Matt Bartley and Kenny Johnson, who've been our partners on this project and also helped make sure that you all knew about this opportunity to hear about the work that we've done with your state agency. Um, it's great to have such good attendance, especially in the month of July. So thanks, everybody, for making time for this. Um, we hope to have a not only a great presentation here that will share things that can be useful to you, but then a good conversation after it. Um, so feel free to ask questions in the chat as we go through our presentation today, or just hold them till the end. We can also allow people at the end to come off of mute and ask questions. We'll certainly have time for it, so, um, so keep that in mind. So um, as um, you all may have heard, uh, Utah DNR was involved in a broader project that we worked on with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism Working Group through funding from a wildlife and sport fish restoration funded multi-state grant um, that came to AFWA and then they worked with us on this um, opportunity. And that broader project we'll talk about in a little bit, but allowed us to survey wildlife viewers across the country, and then also in state agencies that decided that they wanted a state specific sample. So Utah was one of those states, and um, we're happy to be able to share these results with you. So um, our results are also um, fully cataloged in this report that Emily was the lead author on. Uh, the report's available at the QR code that you see on the screen. Also, Emily is going to drop the link in the chat. I'll also say that we'll share every link that you see us drop in the chat here today in an email that follows up with all of the people who registered um, for this webinar. Um, and you'll receive that within a few days after this presentation. So keep a lookout for that if you don't grab all the links here today. Um, we can't go through everything that's in this report. It's very long um, and there's just lots of information in there. We have pulled out the highlights that we think will be useful to you in providing insights for your state. We'll also sometimes just scratch the surface on data related to a certain component of um, the report. So we do encourage you to go check that out, read the full executive summary. And then if there are certain sections that you wanna skip to, go for it so that you can find out more about those topics that are most relevant to your work. As I mentioned, Emily's presenting with me today. She is a master's student at Virginia Tech and has been our lead on this project over the course of the past couple of years. She also was the lead author on the report for your state as well. Emma Posley, an undergraduate, and Christy Potatsky, a PhD student, were also co-authors on the report for your state. So thanks to all of them for their great work and making sure that we could get this report to you all. So we have a few goals for today. Um, the first, of course, is to share um, our survey findings and create a profile of what we know about wildlife viewers in the state of Utah and explore how your agency can better support those wildlife viewers, broaden the relevance to wildlife viewers who do not hunt and fish, and then also develop financial support opportunities for wildlife viewers. And then, as I said, we hope to also have time for any dialogue, conversation, ideas that you have after seeing this presentation. Okay, so let's share with you a little bit about background of what exactly this survey included. So first, it's relevant for you to know how we defined wildlife viewing. We used a definition that pretty closely follows the National Survey of Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Related Recreation. We wanted state agencies, and they wanted to as well, um, uh, to be able to share um, or compare these results to what they see in the National Survey's results. Um, and as we expanded on them, we wanted to make sure we were talking about the same group of people that you have that more extensive participation and economic related information about. So the definition was closely observing, feeding, and photographing uh, wildlife or visiting parks or natural areas to observe, feed or photograph wildlife, and maintaining plantings and natural areas for the benefit of the wildlife. People did not have to participate in all of these. They just needed to participate in one of them. And then if they did, they qualified for the survey. We did clarify that we weren't um, focused on people who just happened to notice wildlife when they were doing something else like gardening or exercising, hunting or fishing or scouting for game. 
we wanted to make sure that when we were looking for people who viewed wildlife, it was those who were focused on the activity of wildlife viewing. Um, but that could just be once during the year and then they would have qualified for the survey. So a little bit about why we did this survey and got involved in this project um, with the, the Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism Working Group. I'm sure as you all know, the trends in hunting and fishing show that those activities are um, declining or remaining stable. And at the same time, the, the number of wildlife viewers across the country and in most states is increasing. And so in your state, as of 2011, there were nearly a million adults um, viewing wildlife. And I would expect that you're seeing an increase as they are in other states and with national samples. Um, the increase that was seen in the National Survey of Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Related Recreation was tied to around the home wildlife viewing. And you will hear us talk about how clearly um, around the home wildlife viewing is important to a lot of um, folks in Utah. And so there was an interest in how can state agencies uh, utilize this growing involvement and interest in wildlife in states and think about how to work more with that population of people who are involved in wildlife viewing. We worked with a great stakeholder advisory committee that Matt was part of and Kenny also participated in as well. And that stakeholder advisory group really helped us think through why was this survey going to be useful for states so that we could make sure that our findings really fed right into those places where the survey would be used. And so we heard from state agencies that this main part that I was talking about with the trends, of course, was on their mind. Viewers are growing in number and they have potential to influence wildlife conservation and management in the state and understanding where they're coming from and what their interests are and increasing their interest in state agencies could be valuable. Also heard that viewers can be really difficult for state agencies to reach. While you all have license programs or license um, for um, hunting and angling, and some states also boating or other um, activities, you don't necessarily have a database and a license and information about how to reach out to viewers. And there tends to be a lack of information at a lot of the different states' levels about viewers' thoughts, preferences, and behaviors. You have some information about their economic investment in viewing. You have information about their general patterns of viewing from the national survey, and then state-specific versions of that. Um, but there was a realization that it could be useful to know more about their conservation behaviors, for example, or what they think about state agencies. And then also state agencies can better serve and communicate with viewers if they understand more where viewers are coming from. And um, also some state agencies were interested in how could they better serve underserved groups, um, people who are black indigenous or people of color and um, other groups that may not be as tied into state agencies. And they thought that the working with the wildlife viewing community might be the place to be finding those individuals or connecting those individuals. And then finally, understanding how and why viewers might become interested in contributing financially to the state. I do want to call out that as we started this work, we did a literature review. Emily and another master's student, Kelsey Jennings, um, combed the literature related to wildlife viewing and then also the subsets of wildlife viewing, such as photography or birding. And they pulled together that literature in a really easy to read um, summary. And it's organized in, in a way that you can quickly jump to the section that might be interesting to you, like why do wildlife viewers get involved in conservation or to what extent are wildlife viewers involved in conservation? And um, then you can see the summary of the key findings from the literature and then also review the references section if you'd like to dig in more. And the last bit of background that I'm going to give you here is, as I've mentioned a few times, we did a survey um, that was at the national and regional level before we worked with the various states who got involved in further sampling. And so if you want to see those national or regional results and see how your state compares, this is the link to the national survey. And I also will say that there's some nice case studies in the recommendation section of that survey showing what various state agencies are doing that could be useful for other states to think about in line with what we found in their various surveys. We'll call out a few of those case studies here today, but if you'd like to read more, you can check out that report. Okay, so now it's time to tell you a little bit about how we conducted this survey. So I'm gonna turn it over to Emily. 
Thank you for the introduction, Ashley. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily. I was really excited to work on this project. I previously worked in Wyoming and I spent a couple weekends in Utah and it's such a beautiful state. I'll get started by talking a little bit about the methods of this survey and share some preliminary or just sneak peek results. So this survey consisted of 713 complete respondents. There were a few more respondents that I'll talk about in a few moments who didn't complete the survey for a variety of reasons. The survey was administered online from October to December of 2021, and it was a big survey. It was 117 survey questions, and it took approximately 15 minutes to complete based on the respondent. After asking a consent question, the survey opened with a screening question, in which, if any, of the following forms of wildlife viewing have you participated in in the past five years? And like Ashley said, if someone said they hadn't participated in any of those forms of wildlife viewing, they were removed from the survey and they did not complete it as we only wanted to study those wildlife viewers here in Utah. So these questions covered a lot about wildlife viewers, including their demographic characteristics, their wildlife viewing behaviors and interests, their duration, location, see, location, and frequency of participation in wildlife viewing, their participation in other forms of outdoor recreation. We took a really close look at hunting and angling, but we also talked about a lot of different behaviors as well. Their level of specialization, so their skill level as a wildlife viewer, and do they own or rent equipment for wildlife viewers, for wildlife viewing. We also examined their wildlife viewing related expenditures related to trips and other expenses. We looked at their barriers and social support in participating in wildlife viewing that we'll talk about later on, as well as their likelihood of participating in conservation behaviors. We also took a really close look at the relationship that wildlife viewers have with the agency. So first, we measured their familiarity with, perceptions of, and trust in the DNR. We also look at their experience with DNR programs and services, as well as the past financial contributions that they had made to the agency. We were interested in their likelihood to support the DNR through financially, as well as through conservation behaviors in the future, as well as how would they like the DNR to spend their funds. And finally, we looked at their preferred forms of wildlife viewing support and communications that they would like from you all as an agency. So we conducted a panel survey, which is something you might not be familiar with. A panel survey is an online survey platform of individuals who are recruited to take surveys. You may have seen an ad maybe on social media or on the television asking for people to sign up and take surveys and for compensation from a form of a gift card or some money. So that is a panel survey where respondents are compensated for their participation. And as social scientists, there's a few tools that we like to use to ensure we have high quality responses to the survey. So these include attention checks, time limits, and quotas, which I'll talk about a little more on the next slide. So we included attention checks. And attention checks are pairs of contradicting statements. So for example, one question may have asked, I strongly, do you trust the DNR? I strongly trust the DNR. And the second question could say, I don't trust the DNR. And if someone said that they strongly agree to both of those statements, so they don't trust the DNR and they do trust the DNR, that was a little red flag to us that they might be clicking through the survey or not paying as much attention as we'd like them to. And so in this survey, if someone failed two or more of these paired statements, they were then removed from that final sample. So they did not count for that number of 713. We also established a minimum completion time for the survey based on a pilot. So anybody else, anybody who completed the survey in under that minimum time was also removed from that 713 and they did, we did not consider their responses in this analysis. And the third tool that we used to ensure we had high quality respond, responses to the survey, something called quotas. So quotas are when you match your population against a known population. So what we did was we turned to the 2016 National Survey of Fishing, Hunting, and Wildlife Associated Recreation and looked at what they found for their age, gender, and education of wildlife viewers. And then we programmed our survey to match those specific demographic requirements. So we had about that 50-50 split between men and women, and only 40% of our respondents were over the age of 55 and plus. And because we use these methods, we're able to feel pretty confident that this reflects 
the beliefs of wildlife viewers in Utah, but we weren't able to determine the total number of wildlife viewers that are in Utah. And for data analysis, we conducted descriptive statistics for the statewide results, and we used chi-score tests and t-tests to explore the differences among consumptive and non-consumptive wildlife viewers. And this data set is openly available for further analysis, which I just put into the chat. So if you're interested in checking this out on your own, you can feel free to do so. And we took a close look at these consumptive and non-consumptive wildlife viewers. So before I came to grad school, I was working in Grand Teton with wildlife viewing. And when I was up in the park, I would see wildlife viewers or birders or bear watchers on the side of the road looking at wildlife. And then if you drive through the park later on, you might see your fly fishermen in the river. And from that stage in my career, when I was working with the wildlife viewers and I saw the anglers as people off in a separate direction, I kind of thought, okay, we've got these two groups of, wild of wildlife related recreationists and there's not a lot of overlap. But what we actually found here in this research is that there's a tremendous amount of overlap between our more traditional hunters and anglers and that kind of newer audience that we're learning more about those wildlife viewers. Here in Utah, in fact, 51% of our entire sample was non-consumptive wildlife viewers, meaning they had not participated in hunting and angling in the past five years. And 49% of respondents were consumptive wildlife viewers, meaning they had participated in hunting or angling in the, in the past five years. So specifically, one third of all respondents in Utah participate in fishing and wildlife viewing. 3% of them only participate in hunting and wildlife viewing, and 13% of our respondents were very busy people who participated in fishing, hunting, and wildlife viewing. And through the rest of this presentation, we'll pay close attention to these differences like you can see on this graph. I wanna draw your attention to, I think it's the bottom left quarter of your screen where you see that little box that's a key for the statistically significant tests. Whenever you see a little asterisk on a graph, that means there's a difference between the portion of hunters or of consumptive viewers, excuse me, and non-consumptive wildlife viewers. So this graph you see here draws back to that screening question, the forms of wildlife viewing people participate in. And here in Utah, we found that people most commonly participated in wildlife viewing through visiting parks and natural areas or photographing or taking pictures of wildlife. And you may be pleased to see that they're really not that often participating in feeding wildlife. I believe just about approximately 20% of respondents said they participated in that behavior. And with this, I'll pass things back to Ashley who will review some key insights from the work. Thanks, Emily, appreciate it. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we're not able to go through everything that's in the report. The way that we organize the presentation is we're surrounding these five key insights. And in each of these insights, we're gonna share some data that supports them and hopefully provide you with some ideas of the direction that you might go for implementing the results of this survey. So first three things that we wanted to share with you is that we think that you could better support wildlife viewers in the state of Utah by providing more wildlife viewing information and access, and we'll dig into that a bit more, promoting around the home viewing opportunities and developing social support networks for wildlife viewers. And then additionally, you can think about broadening your relevance to viewers who do not hunt or fish, that 49% that Emily shared with you, or maybe it was 51%, somewhere around half and half and then also developing contribution opportunities for wildlife viewers. So let's talk first about this wildlife viewing information and access. There was a section of the survey where we gave people a whole array of opportunities in which the state agency could better support them as viewers. And the things that came out as most interesting to people as ways that you could better support them were mostly related to information. You can see that we've got here more information about where to go see wildlife, more information about the wildlife in the state, more information about how to view wildlife, and more information about where and when to view wildlife where there's no hunting. Additionally, you can see that access to more places to view wildlife came up as well for over one third of the survey participants. And I'll come back to that here in a minute. If you're interested in what the whole list looks like, here it is. You can see a whole array of opportunities. In some cases where I have stars on the graph, there is a difference between the consumptive and non-consumptive group, but you can see in a lot of cases there's not a statistically significant difference between those two groups in terms of their interests. 
So as you think about how you might provide more information to wildlife viewers, we again gave people a whole list of options of ways that the state agency could communicate with them and try to look at what was of interest to them. Your website came out really strongly as the top way that people wanted to hear from you with 60% of people saying that that's the way they prefer to receive information followed by email updates and then printed materials. So mechanisms that you're already aware of and using. So there's not a big change there and these could be useful to the wildlife viewing community as well. If you're interested in that full list, you can see it here. And again, there's more information on the exact percentages for this in your agency's report. And it might be useful for you all to do analysis in the future to look at whether or not different demographic groups such as different age groups may have interest in different types of mechanisms. We only compared the consumptive versus non-consumptive viewers, and you can see there are some differences, but the main thing to see across all of these in terms of a pattern is that the consumptive viewers tended to have more interest in hearing from you across all of these mechanisms. And that's probably not surprising because they tend to have a stronger connection to you already. Um, whereas that non-consumptive group, you can see that 15% of them did not want to receive any information from your agency in any way. But it's only 15%, the other 85% showing up at least somewhere on this graph. So as a takeaway from this, wildlife viewers in Utah want more information about wildlife and viewing wildlife. And they turn to your website um, as the, the key place for that communication. So in looking at your website, um, of course, you have lots of great information there. And it seems like a great opportunity to share with people um, more information beyond what you're already sharing, particularly related to mammal viewing, which we saw was of large interest to people. And I'll share those results in a moment. Um, and you may wish to, to do the same on your um, Facebook page as well. There's a state project or multi-state project happening right now that we're involved with. And that multi-state group is putting together templates of information for wildlife viewing for state agencies' websites. So that's something that should be available in about the next six months to nine months. So that's something to look at if you are interested in adding more related to viewing. And several state agencies are finding that they have a lot of luck um, connecting with the viewing committee by having a tab specifically for viewing on their main page. As you can see right now on your website, if a wildlife viewer comes to your website, there's not really a key place for them to go find this information about viewing. So in terms of the interest that people have with different types of animals for viewing, land mammals are first in your state. Um, that's not the case in all of the states that we worked with. Sometimes birds were up there first. Now you may be saying, wait, why is marine mammals so high? You don't have those where we live. Um, we ask people about their interest in viewing anywhere. So it's not specific in this case to marine mammals. In other aspects of the survey, we definitely narrowed in on Utah, but not when we asked what their interests were in terms of types of wildlife. So another thing to keep in mind as you develop these materials for your website, and which also explained probably why we saw so much information or so much interest in more basic information, is that a lot of wildlife viewers in your state and in many other states are beginner, novice, or intermediate. And in fact, two thirds of them are just beginner and novice. And I think this is a really important thing to keep focused on and to think about and has been really surprising to a lot of state agencies because you tend to hear from the wildlife viewers who may be affiliated with a bird club or some other organized um, wildlife viewing opportunity and they may be that more advanced or expert wildlife viewer. So if you're reaching out, though, and trying to build your relevancy with the viewing community more broadly, it's useful to think about people who are not as skilled and could use more basic and beginner or novice level information about wildlife viewing. The other thing to note is there is some statistical difference amongst those these groups that non-consumptive wildlife viewer, the group that's not hunting and angling, is even more likely to be a beginner level wildlife viewer. Okay, so let's talk about the improving access side of things. It's an interesting question about whether or not people um, actually need more access or they just need to know where they can get access to wildlife viewing. Of course, you have all these wildlife viewing locations called out on your website. 
And there are many different state managed lands that state agencies have a connection to. So those could be places that you can outreach with people about their wildlife viewing um, opportunities if they are ones that you want to encourage their involvement in. And certainly thinking about a birding trail could be a great opportunity for you as well. You can see here the opportunities that are provided in Idaho and they find that there's lots of interest in their birding trail there. Okay, so what are the top viewer or top barriers to people getting involved in wildlife viewing? It's a lack of free time, distance to viewing locations and financial costs, which again ties back around to being able to be aware of places to access wildlife viewing and also having those places to access wildlife viewing. If you don't have a lot of time, you don't want to drive very far and you don't want to spend a lot of money having those in the areas where people live are a really useful thing to be thinking about. And we certainly did find that a lot of our wildlife viewers are from um, urban areas. So with that, I'm gonna turn, Emily, turn this over to Emily who can talk a little bit more about providing opportunities for viewing closer to home. Thanks, Ashley. So our second key takeaway is about this importance and potential of promoting around the home wildlife viewing opportunities, which you have already begun to do a little bit on your website. I just grabbed this creating landscapes for wildlife in Utah from the DNR website. So one of the questions we asked our respondents is where in Utah are you participating in wildlife viewing? And to echo the importance of state managed areas for wildlife viewing, 73% of all respondents said that they are going to state managed lands for their wildlife viewing activities. But importantly, over half of them, specifically 62%, participate in wildlife viewing on their own home or property, which is in rural or urban locations. And given this importance of participating in wildlife viewing around the home, one thing that we could suggest you consider is supporting around the home wildlife viewing through encouraging habitat conservation behaviors. To this end, we asked our respondents, which of the following behaviors would you be likely to participate in with or in support of the DNR in the next five years if you had the opportunity to do so? And over half of them expressed a lot of interest in all the activities we submitted on the screen, but I wanted to call out that cleaning up trash or litter, enhancing wildlife habitat, or collecting data on wildlife or habitat, similar to community or citizen science, is something that all these respondents expressed a lot of interest in, which shows the potential for these programs. And we also wanted to note that a lot of the respondents come from urban areas. So when you consider talking about enhancing wildlife habitat, it's important to keep in mind what someone in an urban area or maybe in an apartment could do to help support wildlife beyond those traditional kind of range lands that we see a lot of the time. And our third takeaway is about the importance of developing social support networks for wildlife viewers. We asked our respondents to what extent do these four groups support your participation in wildlife viewing. We found that in Utah and at a lot of the states we surveyed, family and friends provide a lot of influence and support in wildlife viewing, so they're participating in these activities together. But there was really a lack of support from mentors, and we wanted to take a closer look at that using an ethno-racial lens. In Utah, I wanted to draw you to the bottom left-hand corner of my screen where you can see this 87% white only and 13% BIPOC. This is the ethno-racial breakdown of our responses in Utah. And this 13% BIPOC means 13% of respondents identified as black, indigenous, or people of color, a combination of ethnicities or white in another race or ethnicity. And we took a look at this and compared it to the 2020 census from Utah. We found there's a little bit of a gap in representation and diversity. 13% of our wildlife viewers identified as BIPOC, but 23% of the entire population identifies as BIPOC. And one reason for this lack of representation might go back to that mentorship role. And it's this concept called the don't loop. And the don't loop states, if you don't meet others who are engaged in a particular activity, the odds are you will not take interest in that activity yourself. And this just shows the importance of representation, which our friends in South Carolina um, out here on the East Coast did a great job at addressing from a community engagement program. 
In 2015, the South Carolina DNR began a community engagement program by hiring a Hispanic outreach coordinator who developed bilingual resources and outreach strategies tailored to the Hispanic populations in South Carolina. This program experienced a lot of success, and in 2021, they actually began initial phases of a similar strategy to reach the Black population and connect them to nature and wildlife viewing in South Carolina. We also wanted to take a closer look at wildlife viewers with disabilities. So we asked our survey respondents, to what extent do you experience accessibility challenges when wildlife viewing? We use this definition you see here on my screen. Accessibility challenges are the difficulties someone experiences in interacting with or while using the physical or social environment while trying to engage in a meaningful activity such as wildlife viewing. This may be a result of a mobility challenge blindness or low vision, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, being deaf or hard of hearing, or other health concerns. And in Utah, we found that just under one in three wildlife viewers reported experiencing somewhat, quite a bit, or a great deal of accessibility challenges when wildlife viewing. And this tracks pretty well with the United States as a whole. According to the CDC, about one in four adult Americans lives with a disability. So how do we support disabled wildlife viewers? One option may be to consider this birdability map from Audubon here in Utah. Birdability is an organization that focuses on birding for everybody and helps to support disabled birders connect to nature and birds. This map, there's about five locations in these diamonds you can see on a central part of the state, is trails that birders identified as something that could be accessible for birders with disability. And this information and knowing if someone with a disability can navigate a trail is crucial to being able to engage with nature when you have a disability. So in Utah, one suggestion that we could provide you all is with the importance of providing information to disabled wildlife viewers. We did wanna give a huge shout out to the fact that you already have some information about this on your website with the Wildlife Viewing for Disabilities page. Maybe you could consider adding in the birdability map or just providing a little bit more updated and detailed information about these sites and what people could expect when they visit different trails. And with that, I'll pass things back to Ashley to wrap up the presentation with the next two recommendations. Great, thanks so much, Emily. All right, so let's talk about broadening relevance to wildlife viewers who do not hunt or fish. So uh, what we found throughout the survey when we compared the consumptive and non-consumptive viewers on the relationship to your agency in various ways, they have pretty different perceptions and experiences with DNR. And there really seems to be a need to increase basic familiarity with the state agency and provide tailored support to those groups. So I'm gonna show you a few pieces of this evidence and then you can see even more of it in the report. Okay, so we asked viewers, how familiar are you with Utah DNR? And we found um, that, that those who are involved in the consumptive viewer group are more likely to express that they're familiar with your state agency than those who are in the non-consumptive group. So for example, if we just look at those two lighter gray bars and those that are not at all familiar or slightly familiar, you see that about 63% of non-consumptive viewers say they're not at all or just slightly um, familiar with your agency, whereas 32% of consumptive viewers say the same. So that's a pretty drastic difference in terms of their familiarity with your agency. The other thing that we saw that was quite stark in your state, more so than in other states, is that the brand recognition or just awareness of the state agency's logo is lower for non-consumptive viewers than consumptive viewers. So still 60% say, yes, I've seen this before, um, but that's compared to 83% of consumptive viewers. And we see even more differences emerge when we compare their experience with your program services and also the extent to which they give financially to your state agency, which we've shown in other work is connected. So we provided a list of types of programs that state agencies can provide to wildlife viewers. This list was developed in coordination with the stakeholder or the steering committee that we worked with across state agencies. And you can see that in all of these opportunities, that green bar is quite a bit longer and statistically significant difference than the purple bar. In other words, 
People who are consumptive viewers are far more likely to be taking advantage of your programs and services than non-consumptive viewers. And in fact, over 50% of non-consumptive viewers say they've never benefited from any program or service, or I should say never in the last five years benefited from any program or service from your state fish and wildlife agency. So there's really a disconnect with those programs actually getting to those people and then deciding to get involved in, in those programs. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about financial contributions, which as I've said, we've shown in past work that familiarity and utilization of programs um, and involvement in programs and services is connected to financial contributions. And not surprisingly, we see that here as well, that again, there's some differences between the consumptive and non-consumptive group. Before I get into that, just wanted to define something. We looked at um, first non-voluntary contributions, like contributions where you actually get something in return and you're required to pay that amount in order to have access. So like fishing licenses or lands access fees. And then we looked at voluntary contributions like conservation license plates or donations that aren't required to participate in an activity, but still benefit the state fish and wildlife agency. So um, not surprising, uh, given how we define these groups, the fishing license and hunting license numbers were much higher for the consumptive um, viewers than for non-consumptive viewers. We still do see that non-consumptive viewers are reporting that they've bought fishing licenses. It may be that they bought them for someone else. It may be that they bought them but didn't actually use them. Um, so there, there's some sort of um, fishy, should we say, explanation for that 25% having a fishing license. Uh, and then you also see that the things like a fee for a program that you all offer or a conservation or habitat stamp are again higher for consumptive than non-consumptive viewers. Okay, so now let's switch to the voluntary contributions. Um, Matt and Kenny made sure that the options that we gave here were only ones that are actually available in your state. So we just looked at direct donation of money, donation of land to um, through an easement or voluntary conservation or habitat stamp really low percentages here compared to the other options, um, just around 10% or less. And again, consumptive viewers still more likely to give funding um, even on a voluntary basis to your state agency. But they're not all different. So there is are some similarities between consumptive and non-consumptive viewers that you've seen elsewhere in um, our presentation today. And then also, want to point out that when we asked um, consumptive and non-consumptive viewers if they feel like the level of prioritization of programs for viewing in your state agency is too low or far too low or too high, we found in your state um, that the quite a few people, um, you know, about 40% of non-consumptive viewers were saying the prioritization of viewing is low in this state. Um, and likewise, the consumptive viewers also, about a third of them, or about 25% of them, I should say, said the, the same. The good news is about 60% of them say what you're doing is satisfactory to them. And very few people say that you're doing too much. So if you start doing more for viewers, you're likely to make that 40% of non-consumptive viewers or that 25% of consumptive viewers happier that you're doing more and very few people will think that you're, you're taking on too much. And then let's talk about the potential to develop those financial contributions for wildlife viewers. A really positive thing that we saw in your survey results and in many other state agency results is while the contributions to those non-voluntary options were quite low, remember that um, these ones we had that land access permit was, was quite low. Um, fishing license was about what we see here. But there's a lot more interest in funding you than what is currently happening. So this is a place to continue to build your relationship, your awareness, your programming and support for viewers. And then hopefully they will um, also get more involved in non-voluntary support or also voluntary support. If you'll recall, all those voluntary support options were around 10% or less in, in terms of what's actually been happening in the last five years but there was a fair amount of interest in future um, funding opportunities um, through those ways. The other thing that I wanted to point out that we looked into is 
how do you spend that money and how do you tell people you're spending that money can play a really important role in whether or not they decide to contribute. And we first heard this when we did focus groups with wildlife viewers in um, Virginia as part of a project that we did before this national and state level project in other states. And so when we did the, the survey in your state, we asked people, how likely would you be to provide more financial support than you currently do to the agency if your contributions were used in the following ways? And again, we worked with our um, steering committee to develop these ways that someone might um, find that their money is being used by a state agency. And supporting the conservation of rare vulnerable species and also wildlife that people like to view were the highest um, for your agency's um, wildlife viewers interests. But you can see that more than 50% of people for every single one of these options said that they would be more likely to give more money to your agency if they knew that these sorts of options were how their money was being spent. And that aligns with what we heard in Virginia, that people don't want their money just to go to a general fund or potentially go to benefit something that's not important to them. They want to know that it's going to the things that they care about. So an example of how a state agency has accomplished this in Virginia, based upon those results that we found in, in the survey and focus group for them several years ago, they created a Restore the Wild membership type opportunity where people can donate to the state agency. They get the perk of having a land access pass. And then there's different donation levels that they that um, participants get recognized for. And those funds all go to habitat restoration projects that benefit um, wildlife species on wildlife management areas. And then the state agency reports back on those projects every year to all of the people who've donated, as well as those people are then linked into a email newsletter for wildlife viewers. So this can be a, a way to think about potentially building that uh, voluntary funding support um, for a subset of people. All right, so what's next? Um, we have had the great opportunity of working with state agencies um, through this project. We're currently involved in another project that I mentioned earlier on where we've got state agencies that are implementing um, the results of the project. So we will be sharing out those state-specific projects that some state agencies are working on, also the resources that they develop. We also have a grant proposal in for a phase three to this project, which would be related to that disability and accessibility component that we saw um, that Emily shared earlier on and, and thinking about how we can support state agencies and working more with wildlife viewers who are disabled in a variety of different ways and may appreciate different types of opportunities on site or from home um, for wildlife viewing. We're also in the midst of doing additional analysis related to rural and urban wildlife viewers. We'll be sharing that in February at the Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism Working Group's Wildlife Viewing Academy, as well as doing a webinar on that. And then Emily has been doing some more analysis related to the accessibility challenge um, part of the data set as well. And she has a, a manuscript and review from that. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to share that with folks soon. So with that, wrapping things up here, again, here's the link and the QR code for checking out the full report. If there were things that you saw here today that are of interest to you, you want the specific information, um, it's a great place to go look. You can find tables in the back of the report so that you can get the exact numbers. And then as we shared before, also the data sets available to you as well. So finally, feel free to reach out to us if you have any more questions. Emily is a key person to go to. Um, and we also will share with you a link in a little bit here to a short evaluation survey where you can let us know what you um, liked or would have liked to have seen differently in this presentation. And then really importantly, we'd love to hear how you would see yourself using these results. It's really helpful as we work on our current phase of the project and think about how we can roll out the information we have about how people can use um, these results for state projects um, to work with wildlife viewers. So with that, we're done here um, with our part of the, the program. We would really like to um, have time for conversation 
and also additionally open it up to Matt Bartley or Kenny Johnson if they have anything specifically that they want to call out because um, they've been our key contacts on this project within your state agency. So I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see if anyone wants to raise their hand or has any questions in the chat and uh, open it up if Matt or Kenny wants to say anything while people are putting their questions in. And Ashley, I would just add, appreciate you guys doing this. You know, it's one of those things that if we don't ask the questions, we just never know. And and it's easy to just keep assuming, you know, our place in the in the world for some of those people. And so the the stuff you guys are able to uncover is awesome. And and I think it'll help us make some of the, the decisions we have strategically going forward. So appreciate all your guys' work on it. This is this has been great. Great. Thanks so much, Kenny. Appreciate it. Yeah, I guess I would just uh, echo all of that. Like, I know how much time and effort you guys put into this and um, especially the report, like it's 160 some pages and like you guys fine comb, went through that with fine comb. So I appreciate that. Um, and I know we'll be using it as a reference. So I, thanks for, for the work there. Um, and I know like from where I'm at in outreach, like there's a lot that we can do. I think the website is a, is a good one. And then um, we do have a Eccles Wildlife Education Center. So I think some of this we might be able to um, like pilot there, but I'm uh, yeah interested to see uh, what everyone else or if there's any other takeaways or things that popped out for anyone else at the division that's lis listening to where they're at. Great, thanks so much, Matt. I do see that Faith put a comment um, in the chat saying that the communications team has a lot of ideas from this. And uh, one of them is the website that you just mentioned. And Faith, as, as we mentioned when we presented that, um, there is a group of folks who work for different state agencies that's putting together resources and also been just trying to put together a list of what are all the other state agencies wildlife viewing web pages about. So if you'd like us to connect you with Ann Glick from Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, happy to do that because she's leading that subgroup. And that could be a way for you to find ideas from other state agencies um, if you're interested in that. Um, I see George saying there's a lot of opportunities here at Lee K. Um, there's a lot of bird watchers and some of the information could be used to increase participation. So that's great to hear, George, um, that that could be useful. Anyone else who has comments or questions, um, feel free to raise your hand. I see Ta Tanya has her hand up. Go for yeah. it, Tanya. So I was approached recently from a parent that oversees an Idaho uh, blind and disability uh, volunteer group, actually, that uh, they're interested in, and they were interested in coming to our hummingbird banding event this Saturday, and they are coming up next Saturday. And they weren't sure if they were going to make it, but it definitely is something that I would say from a regional standpoint that maybe we don't always take into consideration is those with disabilities. And I do think that that's something that we can monopolize upon. She also was kind enough to send me the ADA requirements um, for effective communication with those with disabilities. Uh, she referenced that in her email. And so Matt, I did send that on to you and Faith to look at already. Um, probably a couple of weeks ago, actually. And so I think that that's something for outreach managers to take into consideration that actually do implement these watchable wildlife viewing opportunities is that we often, I don't think, take into consideration those with disabilities. For the most part, these are ADA accessible locations, but not always. And so it's something I think that we could work more to strengthen um, one of those being asking specific questions in our Eventbrite signups, because we do use a tailored registration for that, asking the specifics of what maybe those with disabilities need, whether that is a deaf interpreter, whether that is someone that um, can help with Braille, maybe with those with the seeing disabilities. And so that's not something that we've ever added to our Eventbrites and something that I think we need to take into consideration moving forward. That's just my thoughts. 
Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Tanya. And we'd love, if we get the funding from the multi-state grant, we'd love to have someone from Utah be involved in our steering committee for that to make sure that what we're looking into and providing best practices on, our hope is to build beyond the ADA requirements to provide other suggestions, You know, not things that you have to do, but as you're trying to really be accessible in your programming suggestions. So. Um, and we'd love to, if you all start doing some more, being able to call those out as examples of what a state agency is doing. So it'd be great to stay in touch about that. All right, um, you all are on it here in the chat. Yeah. This is great. So um, I see that Russ Norvell is saying, thanks. It's great to see these results and looking forward to seeing how we can do a better job of engaging our public. Um, we've got a lot of opportunity here. Avery is saying, what was a land mammal for the purpose of the survey? Emily, do you remember what examples we gave people under land I'm mammal? Broad. I can pull it up. It was any type of land mammals. I think it included like deer and squirrel, just that broad category. And yeah, we certainly didn't give something specific like the marmot as an example, because this was the same across all of the states that we gave it for. So um, yeah, Emily can pull that up and come back to us with that response. Um, and then... I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Akita says, I think there's a ton of opportunity to broaden our engagement um, just through even small changes well beyond the outreach section. Curious what existing processes or systems are making engagement more difficult. Where are the losses or perceived losses to those being benefited most by our current system? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting thing is that I did hear this concern in Virginia. We, we not only did a report for Virginia, but then we also um, went beyond that and did a wildlife viewing plan for the state agency for the next 10 years for what the agency could do. And we had a stakeholder advisory group of stakeholders from across the state, as well as staff work with us. And there was a lot of concern that there was gonna be pushback from um, those who have a strong relationship with the agency already, primarily the hunting community or maybe the fishing community. And when we put out the report for public comment, we, or sorry, the, the wildlife viewing plan, we sent it all over the state to all sorts of stakeholders. We had so little pushback on it. It was amazing. And many people who identified as a hunter or an angler saying, this is great. I'd love for my kids and other kids to be able to get into wildlife viewing more. Thank you for doing this. There were some questions about how is this going to be paid for? Um, but those were, you know, a few. And, and then when it was discussed in front of the commission, I believe three times, there was no negative public comment um, that came to the commission. It was unanimously approved by the commission. And um, now as they're implementing, they're not having any issues either. So I think while there was concern that there was going to be pushback, there was a lot less realized there than what actually happened. And they've gotten a lot more positive um, the other thing, Makita, in line with what you said, is that they did realize that there's some, some internal concerns about working with viewers. And so they have recently worked with their Human Dimensions staff to uh, do focus groups and interviews across the state agency to figure out what are the concerns people have for the agency with, within the agency for working with viewers, or what do they feel like they need to know more in order to work with viewers. And so that's been a useful way for them to figure out what sort of trainings they need to do internally to be able to serve viewers more. So Matt or anyone else who wants to connect with them, um, we're happy to get you in touch with Renee um, Valdez or his staff that are, are working on that within their state. Yes, yeah, Scott. So for 30 years, we've always struggled. How do we get money from non-consumptive users and watchers do you guys have like a favorite state or favorite program favorite way to get non-consumptive wildlife viewers to contribute financially yeah so great question and we get asked all the time my first thing is start doing things for wildlife viewers and they're more likely to give things to you um, you know, you think about where you give donations to, you give your donations to organizations that you feel like have similar values to you, that are going to do things with your money that you believe in, and that, you know, you are, are proud to be supporting. 
So it may be that some wildlife viewers are already at that place with you and still there's some barrier in terms of mechanism, but I think you want to make sure that you feel really good that you're at that place. And I think there's some indications from these results that there's not as much involvement of viewers who are not also hunting and angling with the programs and services that you have. Um, Aside from that, I think, you know, certainly states that have lucked out with getting things like a percentage of the sales tax or some other mechanism like that, it's been really um, a useful way for them to get funding from wildlife viewers. There's certainly the tax write-off um, opportunities in some states are working really well. Minnesota is one that's had a lot of luck with that. They get a fair amount of funding from it um, for their non-game program many of which coming from viewers and they have this bald eagle wildlife viewing camera that is extremely popular. And a lot of the people who give the money through that um, or other donation mechanisms give a donation with like a certain, like, I think they always say 99 cents at the end or something like that. So they've been able to track how many of those people came from that wildlife viewing or from that eagle cam um, and the interest in that. So Minnesota DNR has had some luck with that. Um, I think Virginia is feeling like they're pretty happy with that Restore the Wild program as a new mechanism to get people more excited about giving to their state and um, have been doing fundraising events around it as well. Um, and, you know, of course, conservation license plates in some states have been pretty a uh, great way to go too, especially if you can have them tied. Like I know in, in Virginia, they've been trying to build out the non-consumptive wildlife on those cons conservation license plates so people feel like oh yeah this is the one for me like I've got the hellbender license plate now and so then they feel like they're being recognized as a non-consumptive person um so those are a, a few ideas um there are some states like Arizona that are trying to to um monetize viewing opportunities in the state and they're having some luck with that uh, you know, like you can go out on um, a specific wildlife boating tour and see, um, I can't remember if it's mountain goats or what exactly they're they're looking at um, from the shore of some lake, and you get to go with wildlife biologists from the state. So they've used some of those things as ways to, to raise funds as well. So in some cases, sort of thinking about like the approaches that NGOs that are into wildlife using viewing use, because those people um, the people who are viewers are used to those sorts of opportunities, right? We did do another survey of wildlife viewers um, um, through funding um, and a collaboration with NAWAMP, the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. And we did find that wildlife viewers are giving money and birders are giving money. They're just not giving it to state agencies, right? So it's it's thinking about how to, again, show that you're a group that they want to give money to. Um, and another thing could be partnering with some of those other organizations that they see as relevant. So very long winded response, Scott. I don't have I don't have the one answer, but those are some ideas. Well, we appreciate your insight. Thank you anyway. You're welcome. Yeah. I also wanted to note that we did see lots of non-consumptive wildlife viewers purchasing hunting and fishing licenses and other work has found that they might be doing that just to give money to the agency and a way to contribute to, to wildlife conservation. And this year we're also working with some agencies that are trying to develop like a yearly like wildlife viewing stamp or sticker that they'll sell on their website and then proceeds from that will like go to the wildlife on the sticker. And that's another option to consider. I'm seeing some folks sharing ideas related to donations and events, and then Matt calls out again our results where we did show that if people know where the donations are going and they feel like they're going to a program they're interested in, um, that that's of, of interest to them. Um, any states doing efforts for fish viewing of any sort? Um, yeah, it's a great point that that is a really cool opportunity, especially with the large overlap of people who fish and also participate in fish viewing. Um, I'm not as familiar with state agencies doing it, but at the Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism um, Academy a few years ago, Forest Service was there presenting about their fish viewing program on the East Coast. And so they've had a lot of luck with that. And we're not talking about fish viewing in Florida. We're talking about fish viewing in the Mid-Atlantic. So, you know, you're going out to see darter or something like that. Um, 
my son is a huge fish viewer. <laughs> he gets out with a snorkel in the creek and the river all the time. So it certainly is, is an opportunity. And in the wildlife viewing plan in Virginia, we did call that out as an opportunity because um, some of their fisheries biologists said, hey, wait, you're missing this. This is something that we should be thinking about. Um, so other than a few school field trips, I don't know how much they've really dove into that, but um, there's another pun for me. Um, but I think there's a, a great opportunity um, and certainly something like kokanee that you don't even have to like get under the ground and have a snorkel on, but you can watch from shore is, is cool. Yeah, and a web camera. I do believe Virginia has a web camera for some fishing uh, fish related viewing. I can't remember what it is. And so there may be some other states too that are doing that. Certainly fish ladders and stuff like that can be cool as well in that way. Any other questions, comments? Been great having all this dialogue and sounds like you all have lots of um, ideas, things that you're already running with or things that you continue talking about amongst um, those in the agency. All right. Well, I think we're done here today. And I really do appreciate everybody's time and you all being here. Um, we again will share back the link of this presentation with you all. That will take a little bit of time because we'd like to make sure that our captions for it are corrected so we don't say silly things that it automatically generates for us. Um, but then you can share that with anyone else on staff who may have missed the presentation. And um, also feel free, of course, to be sharing that report out with staff or other partners and organizations in the state that might appreciate it. It's been great to work with you all. I hope that we'll get additional funding from the multi-state grant program to work on disability and wildlife viewing and maybe get to work with some of your staff on that. And uh, hope that you'll be able to use some of the resources that are created from our, our current collaborations with state agencies for developing um, projects related to wildlife viewing. So with that, I think we're done. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. You're welcome.